from the Digital Media Center on the campus of Southern Oregon University in Ashland, Oregon. This is Ramping Up Your English, an educational program for intermediate level English language learners. Here's your host for Ramping Up Your English, John Letts. Welcome to Ramping Up Your English. Ramping Up Your English is for English language learners from all language backgrounds who have already begun the process of learning English as their second language. It's a program for people of all ages. If you're seeking greater English proficiency, this program is designed to help you reach that goal. Ramping Up Your English is a support program for English learners who have already passed the beginning stages of learning English. We take a content-based approach to helping you reach higher English proficiency. We use English to teach English. The theme of our first unit is Trains and Railroads. This is episode 14, segment one. For the past two episodes, we featured Amtrak's Coast Starlight northbound from Los Angeles to Seattle. Today, we reverse course, heading out of Seattle southbound. Now, this hat is a souvenir from the Coast Starlight. You won't see any Amtrak employees wearing a hat like this. It's just for bringing back memories. And there are sure to be great memories if you take this train. Let's watch the first part of south, the southbound journey on the Coast Starlight. Ending a northbound trip on Amtrak's Coast Starlight often means arriving in Seattle in the dark. Beginning your southbound trip, however, means pulling out at a civilized 945 in the morning, affording some great views of the city once you emerge from the underground platform. In the foreground of Seattle Seahawks Stadium, King Street Station is where people board for the eastbound Empire Builder and the southbound Coast Starlight. The station has recovered from years of modernization remodels to be restored to some of its historical grandeur. It's not far from here to Tacoma, Seattle's working class sister. Both cities share the remarkable Puget Sound and the snow-capped Cascades to the east. Between here and Portland, the Coast Starlight looks over the Columbia River with a view of Mount Hood. If you get off at Portland, you'll be free to explore one of the most livable and green cities in the country. A freeway was removed along the river for parkland, which is now Tom McCall Park. On the Washington side of the Columbia River, you can visit Fort Vancouver, the historic Hudson's Bay Company Center that welcomes so many Oregon Trail pioneers. Behind this defensive tower, you can see the highway bridge that crosses the Columbia River to Oregon. Back in the days when this fort traded for beaver pelts, Native Americans would wait outside the gates to be invited a few at a time to trade their beaver pelts for goods at the fort store. Hi, we're at Fort Vancouver. This is the end of the Oregon Trail. This is where many of the pioneers entered their, ended their 2,000 mile journey. Fort Vancouver is right along the Columbia River and was run by the chief factor of the Hudson's Bay Company, John McLaughlin, who's known as the father of Oregon. My second language is Spanish. Here I use my imperfect Spanish to introduce the Fort Vancouver visit. Estamos en Fort Vancouver. Este es el fin del, de este camino, el Oregon Trail, un camino de dos mil millas de distancia. Allí el jefe de esta área por el Hudson's Bay Company fue el padre de Oregon, se llama John McLaughlin. It's normal to make mistakes and not speak smoothly when learning a new language. These mistakes are important to reaching fluency, which you will. Fort Vancouver is part of the National Park System. 
This ranger is telling us about the history of the fort, which traded in beaver pelts from as far away as Alaska and California. Fort Vancouver was administered and owned by a private company, the Hudson's Bay Company. Its chief factor, John McLaughlin, was the law in this whole region. Fort Vancouver became a very busy place. The fort's cannons demonstrated power, but under John McLaughlin, they were never fired in anger. Friendly relations with Native Americans was essential to the business of the English-owned Hudson's Bay Company. The chief factor and the company clerks lived in style, especially considering this was such an untamed land. High tech at Fort Vancouver was blacksmithing. The shop is open to visitors when volunteers are using the era's equipment to work with metal. High carbon wedge to go into, a, uh, into an axe that I need. I, uh, I'm going to make some axe heads like these right here. So far, we've taken Amtrak from Seattle to Portland. Now we ride through the Willamette Valley to Eugene. We'll pass through Oregon's capital city, Salem. The flat, fertile Willamette Valley is the breadbasket of Oregon. I wonder if this is ryegrass, mature ryegrass. I really don't know what it is. Oregon farmers produce most of the country's ryegrass seed, marion berries, and hazelnuts. They also grow hops to help supply Oregon's many microbreweries. All this fertile soil was deposited by a cataclysmic flood, resulting from an ice dam breaking in what's now Montana, sending a massive wall of water into Washington and Oregon. The sediment from that flood settled here, leaving very fertile soil for pioneer farmers and their descendants today. Amtrak's Coast Starlight pulls into Eugene in late afternoon. Eugene is the southern end of the Willamette Valley. Riders are in for some incredible scenery when the Coast Starlight will cross the Cascade Mountains via Willamette Pass. We'll share that in part two of the Coast Starlight Southbound. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English. Further up the track, we'll do some vocabulary work, but first, let's see what book we're reviewing today. This is a Ramping Up Your English book review. After American Railroad's golden age, thousands of miles of track were abandoned. Rather than see these valuable transportation corridors disappear, an organization called Rails to Trails turns them into trails for bicycling, hiking, and sometimes horseback riding. Members get to see good work that's being done by enjoying the organization's magazine. Each issue features rail trails throughout the country, as well as maps that can help them enjoy them. There are always interesting features like this one on railroad trestles. If you want to receive the magazine, you must become a member. I bought my first copy from a group that supports libraries, but I soon became a member myself to support their important work. Millions of people are enjoying healthy lives by getting outside and using these trails. And if you need something to feel good about, you can always enjoy a Rails to Trails magazine. You can contact Rails to Trails at railstotrails.org. You may never get to drive a train, but you can enjoy hiking and biking where the trains used to pass. For Ramping Up Your English, I'm John Letts. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English learners. You can watch and download this program and others by visiting archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Choose Ramping Up Your English from the sidebar or choose my name, John Letts. 
You can see this program on Channel 15 in Ashland and Channel 182 on Charter Cable. This is Episode 14, Segment 2. In Episode 13, we learned how flashcards can help you learn vocabulary about various themes. I demonstrated a simple game that offers multiple choices for repetition in a fun activity. Today we'll do a similar activity with cards, but this time instead of pictures, we'll have descriptions of railroad jobs and train cars. Now, like the previous game, we can lay out the cards face down with the description on one side of a table and the corresponding word on the other side. Before I lay them down though, let me share some descriptions and see if you can guess the worker or the train car. So we're going to start with this one. This is the only part of the train that makes it move. It's where all the power comes from. Well, you've watched a lot of these video clips. You might remember that that is the locomotive. So let's try another one, see if you can uh, do a worker here. This railroad worker is in charge of the whole train. That one might be a, a little bit more challenging, but I have mentioned it in the uh, clips. This railroad worker is in charge of the whole train. And the answer, the conductor. Let's try another one of these. See if you can uh, piece this together from what you've experienced, what you've heard. Maybe if you've checked out some of these books that I've recommended, maybe you have some, some idea from there. This railroad worker moves the switch so the train will change tracks. Didn't mention this a lot, but the answer is kind of in the question. So let me repeat the question. See if that, that very important word uh, it rings a bell, as we say in English. This railroad worker moves the switch so the train can switch tracks. Well, you heard the word switch in there. It's the switcher. So after learning which words correspond to the descriptions, you can reinforce your knowledge by laying out the cards on a table like this. So what we'll do, face down, the descriptions on one side, word on the other. So we lay them out like this. Now this is uh, only going to really be helpful to you if you've already done some practicing like we have now. And then, you know, there's a lot more to them than this, but then you kind of mix them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one went all the way down there. Okay, so you kind of mix them up, especially if you're the one that laid them out. And then the fair thing to do is people take turns. So I'm going to take this card from this side and this card from the other side and see if they match. Okay, this says this freight train, the freight car, has a low profile. It is often used to carry trailers for semi-trucks. Sometimes it carries containerized freight. Well, looking at the other, other card, the name is skeleton card. Since those don't match, you put them back down and you give someone else another chance. So that's, that's how you lay that game out. Uh, some people call this concentration and uh, that's one way to do it. So this is how the game is played. You can see why you need to learn the meanings first or how would you know if it's a match, right? So uh, the game is a fun way to review and practice the learning unless there's someone running the game who's sure of the answers. I find this game excites the English learners and lowers their stress level. Researcher Stephen Krashen calls this lowering the affective filter. High stress levels are shown to interfere with language learning. Games like this provide a measure of safety that allows the language learning to happen. If you can think of other helpful games for learning vocabulary or concepts, let me know by visiting my blog on my website, letscreate.org. I'll pass along the tip to viewers. That's it for segment two. We'll be back with segment three right after this. This is a Ramping Up Your English book review. If you want to go back in time to the very birth of trains and railroads, you want to read the book, The History of Railways by Colin Heinsohn. 
from scholastic books. The book's format reminds me of eyewitness books with small illustrations and ample text. English learners will find that the text is very challenging and there's a lot of text on each page. The illustrations are clear, providing the context to help readers decipher the text. Historical photos depict important events like the Golden Spike Ceremony that joined the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific Railroads as America's first intercontinental railroad. There's a great amount of information in the history of railways. Readers will stretch their English reading skills, but you'll also be re rewarded by a deeper knowledge of trains and railroads. Meanwhile, you'll be ramping up your English proficiency, especially in reading. For Ramping Up Your English, I'm John Letts. Welcome back to Ramping Up Your English, a support program for English learners who want to increase their level of English proficiency. If that's you, you're in the right place. This is episode 14, segment three. Congratulations, I have a gift waiting for you at my website, letscreate.org. It's a bonus video of the Coast Starlight Northbound. Now this bonus video contains the three parts of the Northbound journey, plus some extra footage for you to enjoy. You'll enjoy some jaw-dropping views of Crater Lake, and you'll trace the course of the world-famous Rogue River. Simply go to the episode 14 page on my website and click the link to Coast Starlight Northbound Long and enjoy the ride. On most trains, especially long distance trains like the Coast Starlight, you don't just board the train whenever you feel like taking a ride. There are several steps that must be taken and each of those steps involves the use of English. All of Amtrak's long distance trains require a reservation. This is where your listening and reading skills become critical since most reservations are taken by an automated telephone system named Julie or over the internet. Words like depart, departure, arrival need to be clearly understood as well as the train numbers and the days of the week. This is a, a timetable, also called a schedule, that shows the departure and arrival times of the Coast Starlight. You can get one of these at a train station or over the internet at Amtrak's uh, website. This table is the most important part of the train schedule. Let's go on to the next view. And what we see is connecting train from Vancouver, British Columbia. The times are coded in green. Now our concern is departure from Seattle at 9.45 in the morning. At the very top, we see that this is train number 11, and we also see that this train runs every day. So, notice the orange arrows point downward, so this shows the schedule from Seattle to Los Angeles. The times of the Coast Starlight are in the purple column, along with some symbols. Now, for most stations, arrival and departure times are the same. At some stations, like Portland, the arrival and departure times are separate. That's because the train spends time in that station before departing. This is usually the, a chance to get off the train and walk around a bit before reboarding. Notice on the right side of the table, orange arrows are pointing up. You have to read this schedule from the bottom up if you're traveling north. There's a column of symbols just to the left of the arrows and a purple column with the times to the right of those arrows. Now, since the Coast Starlight is a daily train, you'll have to figure out on which day of the week it arrives at your destination based on the day that you depart. To the right, there's a map and important information about this train, including the meanings of the symbols. So finding your departure and arrival dates are important. That's what you need to know to make your reservation. The price of the ticket is not listed in the turntable, uh, the timetable, I mean. So for that, you have to go to the website, www.amtrak.com. Many passengers buy their tickets while making their reservations. Charging it to a credit card makes it easy to book the trip. You may get a paper ticket in the mail or at a tran, uh, Amtrak station, but it's more likely you'll get an electronic ticket. I find these valuable. 
taking a look at the national turntable. It's a timetable of the trains Amtrak runs, all of them, as well as connecting service. You can look up your train by name or by number. This is especially handy if your trip involves taking more than one train. During your journey, you can keep track of the stations at which your train stops and just where in the USA you are. This vacation guide shows a pre-planned vacation you can book through Amtrak, but it doesn't include the schedules. It's an interesting read, but it's no substitute for the timetable. Doing a function like booking a train in your target language could be quite a challenge, but I found Amtrak personnel very patient and helpful, and sticking to the basics should help you get aboard the train for a memorable journey. Of course, you now have to bring your ticket, paper or electronic, to the station where your train departs well ahead of the published departure time. At smaller towns, a train running ahead of time may leave early, leaving you alone on the platform. Once a train moves out of the station, I have never seen one back up to get a passenger. Getting to the station well ahead of departure time should help you get on the train and enjoy the ride, but it's important to know the name and number of your train so you can see where and when to board. Amtrak's employees are very helpful, but sometimes they may be hard to find. As a passenger, it's your responsibility to board the train in time. You may find a conductor or a train attendant at the doors of the train. Attendants often look at your ticket to get you in the right car, but you have to hang on to it for the conductor to see. Sometimes the conductor will punch your ticket as you're boarding the train. Other times you just get on and the conductor comes around and checks your ticket while the train is moving. Whew, there are a lot of steps just getting on the right train at the right time, but it usually works out even when you seem lost. All the steps require uh, at least a little bit of English, but I've seen non-English speaking guests get by with just gestures. So don't let any of this discourage you. You'll find that the ride is more than worth the uncertainty. Spanish speaking passengers will usually find Amtrak employees that speak enough of their language to get them on the train. Well, it looks like we have some time today for some FAQs, some frequently asked questions. Question. You often suggest reading books that are written in English. What if the viewer can't read English or can't even read in their native language? Well, that's a good question and a realistic one. For those who read in their native language, I still suggest finding these books and others about trains and railroads. I've chosen books that have many illustrations. Those illustrations, along with what you see and hear in the programs and the video clips, can help you start identifying the English words that are related to our unit. I also suggest that viewers find books in their native language that are on the theme of trains and railroads. You'll see the words in your own language that relate to our theme, and then you can start guessing which English words mean the same as the words in your native language. Be a detective. Try to make this a fun mystery to be solved. Sometimes your guesses will be wrong but you'll be surprised how often you figure it out. If you don't read in your native language, you obviously won't have the luxury of making this kind of transfer, yet you can still benefit from trying to puzzle out which of the words and the sentences, what they seem to follow, what you're seeing and hearing in the programs. Even if this is too great a gap to begin reading, the illustrations in the books along with the content of the programs will strengthen your listening skills and you'll still find you're ramping up your English proficiency. Another question, do I recommend visiting a railroad museum? I certainly do. Anything that reinforces our theme to make the content of the programs and the recommended books more comprehensible, that will help you get more out of them. Also, railroad museums are numerous. There's likely to be one within 100 miles of your home. Railroad museums make great family outings. Most have display labels in English, but I wouldn't recommend trying to read everything. Do what's fun there. Make your visit a time of fun. You may find yourself going back for another visit or finding another railroad museum to visit. Well, that's all for segment three of episode 14 of Ramping Up Your English. 
I want to thank my volunteer crew, and I can tell you honestly there would be no program today without each and every one of them. So thank you for your time and talents to make this program possible. Also thank my announcer, Bob Ayers, and I want to thank you, our viewers. See you next time on RVTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English. I'm John Letts. You've been watching Ramping Up Your English, a support program for intermediate level English language learners. Learn more. Visit our website at letscreate.org. You can also watch or download today's program at archive.org slash details slash rogue TV. Join us next time on RBTV Voices for Ramping Up Your English.